I've, I've spent, I guess, the best part of the last 15 years writing about uh, historical mysteries, right? writing factual books about some of the great mysteries of the past. But I, I certainly didn't start out with an interest in in historical mysteries. Um, I, I, I was originally a, a journalist, and I spent a lot of time in Africa. Uh, I was the East Africa correspondent for The Economist, um, based in Nairobi in Kenya and traveling very widely uh, around that region. And back in the, in the 70s and through most of the 80s, my uh, my interest was totally on current affairs mm-hmm. uh, and and politics and uh, wars and famines and everything that one must deal with in uh, in, in in the African context. Right. Um, what happened was that one of the countries that I used to visit very regularly for 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 my work as a journalist was Ethiopia. Ethiopia was very much in the news in the 1980s yes. for, for sad and unfortunate reasons. Yeah. Terrible, a terrible famine and, and terrible series of, of, of wars yeah. racked the country um, and, and made it a, 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 a miserable and dangerous place to live during the 1980s. But I, I had to go there very, very regularly for my work. And while I was traveling in, in northern Ethiopia, uh, I visited a, a a historic city called Aksum, and at that time, uh, Aksum was completely, it was in the hands of the government, but it was completely surrounded by rebel forces, and so the only way into it was to sort of dive down into it in an, in an ancient uh, airplane and hope not to get shot out of the sky, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is what we did. And, and in Aksum, um, I, I came across the most extraordinary story, um, the, the it's a sacred city. It has a it has a cathedral, the Cathedral of Saint Mary of, of Zion. It's important to register that Ethiopia is a very ancient Christian country, uh, and in fact, it it adopted Christianity long before Europe and and uh, Britain did, for example. Mm-hmm. Ethiopia is one of the oldest Christ- Christian countries on on earth, and and in Axum, uh, I found talking to the monks and the priests of Axum. Uh, this, uh, the, the, that they were making the most amazing claim. They, they said that their city was the last resting place of the Ark of the Covenant. Right, right, right. Uh, now, this is, this is the same Ark of the Covenant that, uh, that we're all familiar with from the wonderful Indiana Jones movie, mm-hmm. Raiders of, of the Lost Ark, which had been released actually not long before uh, I went to Axum. So I immediately pricked up my ears and thought, what, what, what on earth is this about? And I... <laughs> I was taken to a, a, a chapel surround, surrounded by steel railings in the in, in the, the courtyard of the of the uh, cathedral of St Mary of Zion, and there I met an ancient monk who who was the guardian of the ark, and he explained to me very solemnly that in the building behind him was the ark of the covenant, oh, really? and it was his role, his responsibility, his sacred trust. To guard and protect uh, the Ark of the Covenant, and yeah. could I see it? No, certainly I could not see it. As a matter of fact, nobody was allowed to see it uh, except him. Um, and uh, in fact, it was a very dangerous object. Uh, in on such rare occasions that it was brought out of the chapel, he explained that it was always wrapped in uh, cloth and in leather bindings, and this was to not to protect it from the public, but to protect the public from it. Yeah. Um, and, and I thought this was the most, the most extraordinary and fascinating story, but obviously I wasn't sure whether, whether there was any truth to it or not. It became, mm-hmm. it became something that I wanted to investigate. Was this just a bunch of crazy old monks <laughs> telling a story? Right. Um, or, was, or was it actually possible that it, that it could be true? And, and during the 1980s, really as a kind of background to other things I was doing, and without any particular focus, I began to gather information on this story. And I began to talk to academics and scholars about it. And I found most of the academics were very dismissive of the Ethiopian claim. Yes, they had heard that Ethiopia claimed to possess the African Covenant, but no, it couldn't possibly be true. That tended to be their attitude. And yet I found that these, these were people who really knew nothing uh, about the Ethiopian claim. And the Ethiopian claim, as I discovered, was, as my research continued, extends much further than Axum. In fact, every single church in Ethiopia, Christian church, contains a replica 
of the Ark of the Covenant, which is kept in its Holy of Holies. Hmm. We're talking about more than 20,000 churches with 20,000 replicas here. And these, these replicas are so important that if they're taken out of the church, then the church ceases to be a sacred building. It's, it's deconsecrated. So there was clearly some, and all of them, gained their power by reference to the original Ark of the Covenant in the sanctuary chapel in Axum, in, Axum, in, in right. northern Ethiopia. Right. And I felt that something so widespread and so so intense and so strongly felt throughout the whole culture couldn't just be based on nothing, uh, as the academics said. So I, so I continued to research and investigate this matter further, and I found that there were many anomalies and many problems. For example, Ethiopia at that time contained a, a population, a Jewish population, and these were, uh, they were called the Falashas, and they were also known as the Beta Israel, the House of Israel. And uh, they were practicing a very ancient form of Judaism, um, a pre-Talmudic form of Judaism. They hmm. still practiced sacrifice. They had priests, which is quite unknown in modern Judaism. They did not have rabbis. And it seemed that they were a sort of frozen pocket of Old Testament Judaism in Ethiopia. And so gradually, as the pieces came together, I began to realize that Ethiopia did indeed have a claim to possess the Ark of the Covenant. Huh, amazing. So, where did it lead? Well, um, Ethiopia was locked in a in 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 a civil war, and my my return visits to the country were getting were getting more and more difficult. I traveled I traveled far and wide, and finally, eventually, uh, in 1991, having this this story extends much more widely than than Ethiopia. To trace the story of the Ark of the Covenant, I found it it was very important to look at the figure of Moses mm. in the Bible. Who who was Moses? What do we know about Moses? Um, he is the he's the one most directly associated with the Ark of the Covenant because when he leads the children of Israel out of Egypt uh, and into the wilderness of Sinai, uh, it's at, it's at the foot of Mount Sinai that the Ark of the Covenant is built. And it's built to contain the two tablets of the Ten Commandments on which the Ten Commandments are, are written uh, by the finger of God in, himself. And, and so we, we can't separate Moses, uh, who receives the Ten Commandments from God. We can't separate him from the mystery of the Ark of the Covenant. So I had to research Moses in depth. That meant traveling to Egypt and getting, this was back in the in the late 80s, and getting myself for the first first time immersed in the mysteries of, the, of Egyptian culture. And of course, Moses, we're told in the, in the Bible, was raised in the court of the pharaohs. This meant that he, would, that he was raised and groomed as a, as a pharaoh. Right, right, and as right. such, he, he would have been um, initiated Initiate. into all the secrets and mysteries of Egyptian magic. Okay. And, I, and I discovered that there were, in fact, in ancient Egyptian tradition, there are many objects which sound like the Ark of the Covenant, golden boxes hmm. uh, containing some mysterious, uh, so, so, some mysterious stone, and these golden boxes are, are are filled with a kind of radiant power, and if people touch them, they are they are struck dead by them. Exactly the same as we read in the Bible about the about the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, it, it, um, it, 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 it was necessary for me to travel to Israel to research this story. Uh, fascinating and wonderful country that I've since revisited many times, talk to scholars in Israel. And, and as I began going into this matter with, with biblical scholars, I realized that there was a real problem because the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned in the Old Testament um, more than 200 times. Right. Um, but at a certain point, it just disappears from the story. Hmm. And that disappearance from the story um, is round about 650 before Christ. It just vanishes completely from the story. And a hundred years later, uh, the city of Jerusalem is invaded and destroyed by the Babylonians. But at that point, it's clear that the Ark of the Covenant has already gone missing. The Babylonians don't get it. It isn't listed amongst the objects stolen from the temple by the Babylonians. So at that end, too, there's a great mystery. This object just vanishes from the story. And and I began to realize that there was a strong case that it could have gone to Ethiopia, and, and I investigate that case in great depth in the sign of the seal. All right, yeah, yeah. Now, I've got two questions for you with regard to that. The first one is, uh, in the literature, is there any reference whatsoever that it, 
that it did disappear, or, or is it just sort of vanish without without anybody even discussing the fact? Yeah, that it there's, vanished? A, there's a quotation in Jeremiah where he where he and this would this would put us around about 650 years before Christ, where he is lamenting, uh, effectively lamenting uh, the loss of the Ark of the Covenant. It's a it's it's, it's a passage that's not widely noticed and mm. sometimes interpreted in other ways by biblical scholars, but it's pretty clear to me. Okay. And, and what's intriguing is that exactly at that time in Israel, we had a, a king uh, on the throne of Israel who is reviled in the Bible for his appalling and, and dreadful acts, and he's called Manasseh, and he persecutes the priests and the prophets, and it's said that the streets of Jerusalem run with blood, and he does something which is just unbelievable in the traditional Judaic context, which is he in, 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 installed a pagan idol, a huge pagan idol, in the Holy of Holies of the Temple of Solomon itself. Hmm. Now, the Holy of Holies of the Temple of Solomon is meant to contain only one object, and that object is the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, the Temple of Solomon was built as a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And biblical scholars agree that the, the, the loyal priesthood at that time, the priesthood of the Ark, could not have allowed the Ark of the Covenant to remain uh, in the temple uh, when it would be defiled uh, by the presence of a, of, of a pagan idol. Hmm. And so it seemed that there was a very high possibility that this was when the Ark of the Covenant was removed from the temple. It was removed in order to protect it from pollution by this pagan idol. Hmm. And so the question was, where where could it possibly have gone? And, and what I discovered was that at exactly that time, and very mysteriously and unexplained by scholarship, uh, a second uh, Jewish temple uh, had been built far away uh, on an island called Elephantine in hmm. Egypt. It's in, in Upper Egypt, near, uh, in the middle of the River Nile, uh, near the modern town of Aswan. Okay. And this temple, we know from from records that have survived, that it had exactly the same dimensions as Solomon's Temple. But in the, in the Judaism of the time, it was really extraordinary and inexplicable that a temple should be built anywhere outside Jerusalem. There was only supposed to be one temple, and that was, that was Solomon's Temple. And the only possible justification for building another would have been to house the Ark of the Covenant. So, so my my explorations then took me in that direction to, mm. to southern Egypt and to this island where where this Jewish temple was built. Now, of course, what lies beyond southern Egypt are the deserts of the Sudan, and soon after, soon afterwards, the mountains of Ethiopia. Mm. Uh, and the Blue Nile, the Nile River system is made of two rivers, the Blue Nile and the White Nile, which join um, in, the, in Khartoum and Sudan. The Blue Nile originates in Ethiopia, and it originates on a, a, a wonderful lake in the highlands of Ethiopia, really? called Lake Tana. Interesting. And so I had to go, went off to Lake Tana, and there I found again more stories about the Ark of the Covenant, and, and an island where they claimed that the Ark of the Covenant had first been brought before it was taken to Axum. And finally, I had all the pieces together, and I had to go, to cut a long story short, and I had to go back to Axum in the middle of the Civil War. Uh, it involved a, a, a nine-day journey from the Sudan, across the deserts of the Sudan, uh, up into the mountains. It's all by four-wheel drive vehicle, driving only at night, because the Ethiopian Air Force was constantly bombing the roads during the day. My God. At, this, at this point, I was traveling with the guerrilla movement, the, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, as they were called at that time. Um, they they, they kept, me, kept me safe and took me on this extraordinary journey through the mountains and eventually back to Axum, where I was once again able to confront the guardian of the Ark of the Covenant, and, uh, who, who, who told me amazing things. Amazing. Incredible. Let me ask you this. There seems to be a reference... Uh throughout many different sort of traditions about it, the Ark being some sort of technology almost. Uh, and you mentioned yeah. that there's this sort of, uh, it certainly has an effect, a physical effect that there seems to be concern about. Uh, maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Do we have any idea what, what, what this thing might have been or what it sure. was used for? Or? I, I, I do go into this at some, at some length in the sign of the steel, and I was more or less obliged to do so. Uh, by the evidence that is found in the ancient text. You know, when I was when I was studying the background on the Ark of the Covenant, the Bible itself is, a, is of course, a huge source of reference on this subject.
right. but there are much there are many other sources outside the Bible, uh, in particularly in Jewish legends and traditions, which add to our information about the Ark of the Covenant. And really, everything that we can read about it, uh, were it to be applied to a mod- modern object, we would immediately say this is a piece of technology. This is uh, this is something very powerful with a, with an energy source that perhaps we don't fully understand. There are accounts of the ark lifting up off the ground and flying uh, towards the enemies of Israel. As it does so, it emits a moaning uh, uh, sort of sound, a kind of howling sound as it goes as it goes through the air. Uh, there's 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 an extraordinary episode in the Bible where the ark is actually captured by the Philistines in a battle between the Israelites and the Philistines. It's briefly captured by the Philistines and they take it back to their city. And they make the they make the mistake of opening the lid of the ark, right. and, and and what happens is that the the whole population of the city who've been gathered around and peering down into the ark of the covenant are are struck down with a with a, a terrible and inexplicable disease, which in fact, in if if you if you look at the translations closely, is is described as tumors. Hmm. That the people of the city are struck down with tumors. And that they die a horrible death, so much so that they that they, all they want to do is to get rid of the Ark of the Covenant, mm. and they send it back uh, on the back of an unmanned manned, uh, ox cart. They send it back to the Israelites because they're so afraid of it, and they don't. They clearly do not know how to handle it mm. and how to deal with this, and so it goes back to people who do. There's there's an account of the Ark being taken up to Jerusalem by King David. And uh, this is after the, after the years of wanderings in the wilderness, and finally it's taken up to Jerusalem. And on the way to Jerusalem, uh, again, it, it's on the back of uh, of, of, of a, a cart. It seems to slip, and and one of the men in the crowd reaches forward to steady it, and and he is instantly struck down by a bolt of fire, which jets out of the ark and and just fries him on the on, on the spot. Now his his intent was innocent. He meant to help. He didn't mean to do harm. But it, so it seems that the, the, this was not some kind of moral judgment on him. This was just something inherent in the properties of the Ark of the Covenant itself, that it has these, hmm. these incredible, this, this incredible energy source and right. the power jets out from it. And so, so from, from a compilation of many different accounts like this, I, I began to wonder, seriously, could this be some kind of object of technology? And hmm. if it's an object of technology, how do we explain that? And I'm, I'm convinced the answer to that lies in the mysteries of ancient Egypt, the, the overwhelming evidence that ancient Egypt uh, received a legacy of knowledge from, a, from an earlier culture, mm. and that maybe objects like the Ark of the Covenant were part of this, of this legacy of knowledge. I don't mean to put down its sacredness, uh, its, its connection to God. All of that uh, is there as well. But, but it's just an objective study of the character of this object says to me, technology of some kind that we don't understand. That sort of leads into something that I was going to ask you anyway, so now's a good time to do it. You know, the the, the, the standard model of history basically tells us that it's, it, it's a linear sort of path, and we went from sort of stupid, primitive, to uh, supposedly smart uh, in, our, in our present form. But th- there are many holes in those theories, and there's lots of evidence apparently out there that suggests that there were that, that history is perhaps more cyclical and goes through ups and downs, and there were perhaps civilizations long before our own that were that were in fact quite advanced. And maybe you could uh, speak to that a little bit. Yeah, this this has become a, a theme of of my work over the last fifteen years, really, and it all began because of the research that I did in the Sign of the Seal uh, in, into the Ark of the Covenant. As I said, that part of that research involved my first travels in Egypt and, and uh, confronted me with some of the, the riddles and the mysteries of, of Egypt as I tried to get to know the figure of Moses and his Egyptian background better. And, and uh, the first time that I stood in front of the Great Pyramid of Egypt, mm-hmm. I, I realized that I was standing in front of another mystery, mm-hmm. uh, perhaps even deeper than the mystery of the Ark of the Covenant, and I determined that I would uh, begin to look into this when, when I finally finished the work on the Ark of the Covenant. Um, the Great Pyramid is 450 feet tall. It weighs 
1.6 million tons. It has a footprint of close to 14 acres. Um, it's perfectly, perfectly, perfectly aligned to true north, south, east, and west. The, the error in alignment to true north is just three sixtieths of a single degree. It's almost um, uh, clock-making accuracy. It's, okay. a, it's a really fabulous accuracy. It's a fabulous accuracy in a small building, mm. but to find it in a building on this scale, uh, one of the first large buildings, supposedly, that was ever built by humanity, uh, really does create a problem, and, and we have to ask ourselves how, where and how and in what way did the ancient Egyptians learn to do this, if indeed it was built by the ancient Egyptians. Hmm. Um, and and the, the story is that the pyramid was built 4,500 years ago in 2,500 BC, and indeed if we look back we find that there's about 100 years of, 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 of building before that, and then just nothing. Uh, and, and, and it really is a mystery as to how they did this. So I began to wonder, what, what, what can be the, the explanation for this? Could it be, as the ancient Egyptians themselves say, that their civilization was a legacy uh, of, of an earlier civilization mm-hmm. which, to which something had happened, uh, uh, which had passed its knowledge down to the ancient Egyptians, but itself had disappeared from the stage of history? And I, and I began to, to discover that this problem is, is so all over the world, um, and that history may indeed not be the straight line that we're taught in, in class. It may not have just been a, a continual ascent uh, from primitive and stupid ancestors hmm. to the, the wonderful, wise, technologically modern world. It may be a much, much more complicated process than that, in which civilizations rise and fall, and some and some are obliterated uh, in, entirely from the from the record. And this investigation uh, eventually led me, led me to write the book uh, Fingerprints of the Gods, right, which, is right. a, which is which is a comprehensive uh, exploration of the possibility that we may have lost a whole episode uh, of human history, a very important episode, uh, and that that this would need to be taken back very, very far in the story. We need to go back about 12,000 or more years uh, to start finding the traces of that lost civilization and that the, the most likely uh, circumstances in which it was lost from the record is what we know of as the end of the last ice age, hmm. uh, which indeed occurred uh, during the period about 12,500 years ago that the, the planet had been covered in gigantic ice sheets. I mean, North, North America uh, was covered in ice that was two miles thick. Uh, Northern Europe was covered in two miles thick ice sheets as well. So much water was taken up out of the sea to freeze into these ice sheets that sea level was more than 400 feet lower than it is today. Hmm. Uh, and when all that ice melted and the water went back into the oceans, the sea level rose by 400 feet, and it swallowed up more than 10 million square miles of land all around the world Mm, that that had been above water. Uh, It was a cataclysm on a gigantic scale by any standards, and in such a cataclysm, I believe we lost the traces of an earlier civilization that now is remembered only in myth and tradition. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. All right, well, look, uh, let's take a break. We're almost at the bottom of the hour here. So we'll uh, hold on for a moment, and we will come back with my guest, Graham Hancock, and uh, we'll continue our conversation with him tonight. Uh, You can get information about Graham and uh, much of his background material, all of his books available, and some videos, I think, as well, at www.grahamhancock, that's G-R-A-H-A-M-H-A-N-C-O-C-K.com. And you can also get there directly from the Mike Hagan website as well. All right, we'll be back in just a minute, as we said, with Graham Hancock, talking more about uh, this amazing adventure that his life has led him on. And we've got uh, got a whole list of questions here that uh, we can ask him as we get moving. So, all right, stick around. We'll be back in just a few minutes. This is a little bit more from Yachai. And this music, uh, this song, I should say, is appropriately entitled Ark. We'll be back in just a few minutes with Graham Hancock. This is Mike. You listen to Radio Orbit. All right, one more time. That was Ark from Yachai. And that's on their CD, Sweet Mother Mercy. We've been featuring that all night. And we'll have a few more songs from Yachai throughout the rest of the program. All right, this is Mike, and you're listening to Radio Orbit. My guest is Graham Hancock. And we're talking about much of the uh, 
uh, adventure that's uh, sort of taken him along an amazing path over the last uh, many years. And, Graham, we were talking about Egypt, and there are so many questions that come to mind. Uh, but I guess one of the things that I've learned is that the oldest architecture seemed to be the most sophisticated. And, there seemed, and it seems like there's, there, there's an idea that most people sort of imagine that, the, that it was a progression in the opposite direction. But it turns out that the oldest stuff is apparently the best. Yeah, that's that's uh, that that is one of the, the very the very strange and, and and inexplicable mysteries about Egypt, and and, and it's why uh, I and, and a number of other colleagues were working in this field, um, and I'd like to pay tribute particularly to to John Anthony West, mm. a great uh, independent uh, Egyptologist, uh, who's done so much to open up our thinking on on ancient Egypt. We've 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 come to feel that. But there must be something behind ancient Egypt which the which the historians are missing, and and to get the first clue that there is something behind ancient Egypt, you only miss, need to listen to the ancient Egyptians themselves uh, in their texts that have come down to us. They speak repeatedly mm-hmm. of a mysterious time that they call Zeptepi, mm. and Zeptepi means the first time. Right, the first time, uh, and it's the it's the time of the gods. It's the time. It's the time when the gods are said to have lived on Earth and to have, to have chosen Egypt as their as their special place. And they uh, they build uh, mounds uh, on certain sites, which become the basis of all future temples. So it's just, it, the sense is that every Egyptian temple and every Egyptian sacred building is built on a place that was made sacred in a much earlier time by the gods themselves. And I think partly it's this process of construction and reconstruction on very ancient sacred sites that has led to the confusion about the antiquity of Egypt in, in the minds of, of scholars. Scholars are determined that it all begins uh, around uh, 3000 BC, which is 5000 years ago, mm-hmm. and just aren't open to the idea that there might be an earlier layer or level of civilization uh, in ancient Egypt. But if you go to Giza, where the three great pyramids are built, you can see this uh, confusing picture very clearly because there's no doubt that that large parts of the superstructure of the three pyramids at Giza uh, were indeed created by the ancient Egyptians in the time frame that scholars say, which is the the period of around 2500 B.C., Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't, I don't dispute that. But what's intriguing is that there are other structures on the site uh, which show every indication of being much, much older. And the best example of this is the Great Sphinx of Giza. Right, right. The Sphinx, of course, is a world famous uh, monument. It's a kind of icon for everything, uh, for, for every mystery of ancient Egypt. And there it is. It's a lion-bodied monument with a human head. It faces exactly due east. It is carved out of solid rock. It's 70 feet high. It's 270 feet long. It's the most enormous rock carving that you can that you can imagine. Now, John Anthony West, who I mentioned earlier, together with Professor Robert Schock, Robert Schock, of Ge- Robert yeah. Schock yes, he's the, the professor of, of geology at uh, professor at Boston University. Right. As a matter of fact, Graham, it was I think one of my first uh, one of my first the first times that I heard your name, I think, was a special that I saw. It must have been on the Discovery Channel or the Learning Channel or something like that. Uh, but it was yeah. with you and uh, and Robert Schock and and, yeah. and John Anthony West, if I remember correctly. And it was amazing, and it blew my mind. And I, and that was when I bought uh, I, the first book that I bought of yours. So anyway, right? Yes, we've worked together uh, quite quite a bit. And I was I was in fact recently in the U.S. at a, at a conference with uh, with with Robert Schock. Um, he's um, What's, what's important to note about Robert Schock is, first of all, he is an absolutely established, tenured, mainstream academic scholar. Right. Uh, and secondly, he has been willing to consider possibilities that other scholars have not been willing to consider. And, and Robert has been driven towards considering these possibilities strictly by the scientific evidence. Mm. Nothing else. He has no preconceptions, nothing that he's trying to impose on the data, but the scientific evidence convinces him that the Great Sphinx is much older than Egyptologists believe. Hmm. Egyptologists believe that the Great Sphinx was built in two, cut out of solid rock right. in 2500 BC, four and a half thousand years ago. But the 
patterns of erosion and weathering on the body of the Great Sphinx and on the sides of the huge trench of rock that it was cut out of, mm-hmm. uh, it, it bears the unmistakable marks of, of weathering by very, very heavy rainfall over a very long period of time. Huh. And, and we have excellent studies of ancient climate now, which geologists have conducted. And those studies tell us that, since the, that in the last 5,000 years, Egypt has received very little rain. Huh. It hasn't received the kind of rain that could have caused this very deep uh, weathering that we see mm-hmm. on the uh, on the sink. Hmm. And, and you really have to go back thousands of years earlier uh, to find the kind of conditions at the end of the last ice age when the ice sheets were melting and heavy rain did fall on ancient Egypt. And therefore, on the geological evidence alone, the Sphinx appears to be much older than Egyptologists have guessed. And in fact, there is no, there is no objective scientific test that Egyptologists can use to date the body of the Sphinx. Many people think that carbon dating uh, it w- would provide a, a definitive answer on this, but actually it doesn't provide any answers where stone monuments are concerned. Hmm. If a monument is cut out of solid stone, as the Sphinx is, you cannot date it with carbon dating. Hmm. Carbon dating only dates organic materials right, that are right, associated right. with the stone. So, okay. so actually when the Egyptologists say that this Sphinx is 4,500 years old, they're just expressing their opinion. They aren't expressing a fact. And, and Robert Schock has provided very important counter-evidence uh, to this Egyptological view and suggested to us that the Sphinx may be much, much older than, than, than we believe. There are other huge structures at Giza, so-called mortuary temples, the Temple of the Sphinx itself, which are made of gigantic blocks of stone. These blocks weigh as much as 200 tons each, like a, like a huge diesel engine on a train. Oh, gosh. They've, they've, been, they've been lifted uh, into, into position tens of feet above the ground, perfectly, uh, perfectly jointed and connected to one another. It really is like the work of giants. Hmm. And in the case of the Sphinx Temple, we know that whenever the Sphinx was built, that was the time that these gigantic temples were built, because they're made from the same rock that, that was cut out to okay. create the body of the Sphinx. Right. And therefore, if the Sphinx is older, then the temples are older. Now, now hmm. we ourselves, in our culture today cannot very easily move blocks of stone weighing 200 tons. We can lift weights of that of that size, but it involves gigantic cranes, right. very, very high technology, and often takes weeks to get into position for a single lift. Hmm. And here we have whole buildings created out of these absolutely enormous blocks of stone, and by all the, the, the geological evidence, way before anything that we call history uh, began. And, and underneath Giza, underneath the Great Pyramid, a hundred feet under it, you find yourself into a, a, an extraordinary labyrinth of, of tunnels and passageways uh, that exist under the Giza Plateau. And again, the evidence is, uh, and, and I do go into this, of course, in much more detail in my book, the, the evidence is that these subterranean areas of Giza may also date back to that much earlier period. So I think we have a site that contains rock-hewn and tunneled structures that are perhaps 12,000 years old and that was later uh, completed and finished off by the ancient Egyptians in the historical period. The ancient Egyptians felt a connection to that earlier time. They had received wisdom and knowledge passed down from that earlier time, uh, and they finished off the job, and it's because they were involved on the site as well as the earlier culture that there's this confusion about the identity mm. of the site. Huh, and then, and then it, it sort of makes a little bit more sense then why, why it was a technology that, that, that seems to be lost over time. The way I figure it, it was something, something like this, um, that, there was a, that there was a former civilization, that it was destroyed in the gigantic cataclysm at the end of the last ice age, mm-hmm. that there were survivors, uh, that these survivors settled in different parts of the world, mm-hmm. that they did not immediately attempt to rebuild their whole civilization in the way it had been before. Possibly they felt that they had angered the gods. Possibly they felt that they should not try to go that route again immediately. Uh, I think what happened was that they established something like uh, a monastery mm, a in various locations, one of those locations being, being Giza in Egypt. Okay. And in these monasteries, they preserved 
the best of the wisdom of their culture, and they recruited new members of the monasteries from the local population that lived around them and trained them into the mystery, uh, and thus preserved the knowledge and passed it down generation by generation uh, until uh, at around 5,000 years ago, uh, not only in ancient Egypt, but all around the world, um, for, for, for reasons that are, that are still uh, mysterious to me, that seem to be connected in some way to a timetable that is expressed in patterns of stars in the sky, hmm. that they switched on ancient Egyptian civilization, just like a light being switched on, hmm. and that this, was, that this was done all over the world at the same time. It's not an accident that, that in the Indus Valley in, in India and Pakistan, we again see a sudden emergence of civilization between 5,000 and 4,500 years ago, the so-called Indus Valley civilization. Right. We see it in China uh, at exactly the same time, and lo and behold, we see it in the Americas as right. well. Because right. right. you, have, you have pyramids being built in Peru mm-hmm. uh, 4,500 years ago at exactly the same time that the ancient Egyptians are, are, are doing their work on the pyramids in Giza. So it's, it's, it's as though... A message from deep antiquity, a, a, a knowledge and a system of knowledge was preserved for a very long time and then put back into action at the beginning of what we think of as history. All right, interesting. Um, with regard uh, to Giza, well, actually, I, well, I want to close one circle, actually. You mentioned that yeah. uh, uh, you, you were talking about Moses earlier. And so, yeah. so Moses would have been one of these initiates uh, that you just spoke of that, that, that would, yes. have, would, would have been a, a, a holder of some of this knowledge. Exactly. That's, that's, that's my view, that, that, that as an individual groomed to be a pharaoh and raised within the pharaoh's household as a prince of Egypt, mm-hmm. uh, he would automatically have been initiated into the high wisdom of ancient Egypt. Right. And this high wisdom was the wisdom of the gods, as the Egyptians saw it, which had been passed down since the first time, since the, that period that they called Zetepi, right, which had been passed down for the benefit of mankind. And so, and so Moses would have inherited and been trained and taught in this, uh, in this system of knowledge. And that may explain why the Ark of the Covenant uh, is, is such, a, such an extraordinary object and does mm. the things that it does, hmm. uh, bec- because the knowledge for that came out of that heritage, that, that legacy, that also created mysterious monuments like the like the pyramids of Egypt, which we would find very hard to build today. But it was a high technology of a kind uh, from from deep in prehistory, and therefore it's not it's not an accident. It's obviously intriguing that other objects like this are described in the ancient Egyptian text. All right. Well, uh, a minute ago you were also speaking about about this labyrinthian tunnel system. Under, yeah. Underneath Giza. Now, uh, I remember a few years ago, actually, there was quite a bit of talk about it. There was a, sort of a buzz on the Internet, and I read a lot of stories about this, that, and the other thing. But it sort of put quieted down or something, and I don't know. I just, I, I'm curious about it. Maybe you could give, give us your take on, on what's happening. Yeah, there's something, there's something odd going on. You're right. There was a buzz uh, about this. The buzz really began. Uh, in the early 1990s, about the time that, that John West and Robert Schock, uh, myself, and also a, another very close friend of ours and a co-author with whom I've worked several times, Robert Baval, mm, sure, all of us sure. were, were, were focusing on the the, 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 the mysteries of the, of, of the Giza Plateau. And at exactly that time, uh, a German engineer called Rudolf Gantenberg, mm. who had been hired by the Egyptian government, the, the Egyptian Antiquities Department, to do some accurate measuring inside the Great Pyramid. Uh, Rudolf Gantenbrink uh, conducted an exploration of a very mysterious feature of the Great Pyramid. Uh, the Great Pyramid, I mentioned earlier, we, we, we need to just re, to, to picture again the gigantic scale of this monument. Right. That it's a, a six-million-ton monument, and it's 450 feet tall. Oh, my God. And it isn't solid stone inside. It's full of galleries and passageways and chambers inside. Hmm. When you enter the Great Pyramid through the north face, through the, the entrance in the north face, you find yourself 
in a in a system of passageways which which rise at a steep angle of about 40 45 50 degrees and these uh, these passageways are about 3 feet high and 3 feet wide so you have to crouch uh, as you as you walk up them as you labor your way up them very very steeply right. and then you find yourself at about about a quarter of the way up the height of the Great Pyramid, but you're inside it. You find yourself that this narrow entrance passageway opens out into a huge gallery. And this is called the Grand Gallery. Uh, and it's 30 feet high and it looms over your head and you just have this sense of enormous space receding forever. Hmm. Uh, and at that level, there is a, also a horizontal passageway that leads you to one chamber, which is called the Queen's Chamber. Hmm. For no good reason, it's just a name that Egyptologists have given to it. There's no specific connection with queens whatsoever. Okay. Uh, and then, right up at the top of the Grand Gallery, there's another chamber, and this one, again, for no good reason, is called by Egyptologists the King's Chamber, right. and it's mm-hmm. a very large, beautiful room uh, lined with granite blocks. Now, both of these chambers have a very extraordinary feature. In the north and south wall of each chamber, there is a small hole. The hole is square, um, and uh, it is is about nine inches high and nine inches wide. And in fact, it's the opening to a tiny passage. And these passages angle up through the body of the pyramid. Hmm. And in the case of the passages from the king's chamber, they actually emerge on the outside of the body of the pyramid, and both of them turn out to point at specific stars in the sky in, hmm. in ancient times. The ones in the Queen's Chamber, further down the Great Pyramid, it also has two shafts like this, one going north, one going south. And they do not emerge on the outside of the pyramid. They stop somewhere inside the pyramid. And so this German engineer, Rudolf Gantenbrink, designed a robot. And the purpose of the robot was to explore these shafts. Hmm. And uh, the, the, when the robot uh, went up the shaft of the Queen's Chamber, uh, it discovered, lo and behold, another door about 150 feet further up the shaft, uh, another door with metal handles huh. uh, leading who knows where. Uh, there was a sense that behind that door there might be some great uh, discovery to be made, if only it was possible to access it. But it was like a tantalizing puzzle hmm. that the ancient Egyptians had set us, almost as though they were waiting for the time when we could develop the technology to explore these shafts, because hmm. they can only be explored with technology. They're much too narrow to put a person inside. Um, and this is where the, where the real problems began, because as soon as that discovery had been made, the Egyptian authorities closed the research down and wouldn't allow any more research to be done uh, on the site. Hmm. Now, there is talk that a new robot has been has been designed. In fact, I know for a fact that a new robot has been designed, and it's been designed at the University of Singapore. Hmm. Uh, they're working closely with the Egyptian antiquities authorities. And I would expect within the next six to nine months that we are going to hear um, reports of what that robot finds. It needs to be able to go through that second doorway uh, and search into the cavity that lies beyond it. But uh, we will definitely be hearing more about this later this year. Not later this year, within the next six to nine months. Whether what we hear is the whole truth <laughs> is, 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 is another matter because there has been a great deal of secrecy uh, surrounding this investigation ever since that first robot was sent up the shaft. It's mm-hmm. almost as though the powers that be do not want us to know what's going on, and we can't even be certain that explorations have not taken place already, which right. we haven't been informed about. The mm-hmm. same goes uh, for work around the Sphinx. Uh, John Anthony West and his team conducted seismic survey work around the Sphinx, and there, with, with uh, Robert Schock, and their seismic work uh, indicates very clearly the presence of a large chamber underneath the left forepaw of the Sphinx in the bedrock, a very large, regular cavity. Uh, now, one would have thought that, that archaeologists would have been rushing from all over the world to explore that chamber and right. find out what is in it. Right. But in fact, again, no further research has been allowed, at least officially, hmm, uh, since, that, since that time, which obviously raises, raises legitimate suspicions uh, that something 
that we don't know about uh, is, is going on here, uh, particularly since there are traditions in ancient Egypt of a kind of hall of records, a right. hall of archives, right, right, right. Preserved, preserved from the time of the gods. Uh, what, a, what, what, what a likely location it would be that we might find that hall of records either inside the Great Pyramid or underneath the body of the Great Sphinx. So these are intriguing areas of inquiry, but unfortunately, uh, the, the detailed open research that needs to be done so far has not been done to follow any of this up. Hmm, amazing. Absolutely amazing, yeah, because you would think that, uh, that it would be, you know, if, if the spirit of science is really alive, <laughs> right, uh, then, yeah. then, then, then that would have been, uh, it would have been something that happened almost immediately. But obviously there's somebody putting the clamps on. You yes, know, and, and you would expect it to happen in, with full public information. Right, right. Because after all, these, these are a universal legacy of, right. of all of mankind. These, these monuments don't belong to particular archaeologists. Right, it's just or even to particular governments. They're, they're, they're a universal legacy of the whole of mankind. We all have an interest in knowing uh, their, their, their secrets. Their secrets have been preserved you know, for a reason up to now. And that, and that is, for, I believe, for the, for the enlightenment of mankind. So I find it very, very disturbing that, that there is this degree of secrecy and intrigue uh, surrounding research at the at the pyramids and the Sphinx, but I have to say it doesn't surprise me, <laughs> right. because knowing knowing academics as I do, they are extremely territorial. They are extremely jealous of their own areas of research and territory. They deeply resent the involvement of outsiders uh, in these matters, <laughs> and it's partly because Rudolf Gantenbrink, the engineer who designed the first robot, was not an archaeologist. Was not. Uh, an, uh, an insider to the world of, of Egyptology. Right. So also is the case with John Anthony West, with myself, with Robert Bovar, with Robert Schock. We are, we are not insiders in the world of Egyptology. So any insights and, and, and investigations that we produce tend to be automatically rejected by, by the inside team. Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, uh, regardless of the evidence they're, uh, they're in, and this is the problem, is that uh, it's, it, it's it's a it's a sort of attack the messenger sort of thing, uh, without without looking at the information that's there, which is without looking at the information. In general, the whole the whole notion that lies behind all this of a, of a cyclical process in history, that great civilizations of the past may have been destroyed and erased from the historical record, leaving only few traces here and there. Such ideas are very, very unpopular with academics. Hmm. Uh, of course, it touches on the whole issue of Atlantis right. and, and uh, the, the whole issue of the Great Flood. Many of these ideas, uh, mainstream archaeologists and, and, and academic scholars simply refuse to consider them. Uh, they, they, even without any investigation, they somehow automatically know that the ideas are wrong. Right. And this, of course, is very bad science. Science should keep a very open mind on all possibilities until those possibilities have been definitively disproved. And the possibility of a lost civilization and its connection to a great global flood has not been definitively disproved. Uh, it remains a very real possibility. And, and uh, in, the, in the absence of mainstream science investigating it, uh, a few individuals such as myself and, and others have devoted our time to investigating these problems. Yeah, well, it's 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 a very interesting topic, and as a matter of fact, I had I had a gentleman on the air last week. His name is Michael Tsarion, and and yeah. he's, he's got a pretty interesting story to tell. And then uh, Walter Cruttenden is a is a guy who I think you're familiar with because well, Walter Walter Cruttenden has done very important work, and perhaps we can touch on that in the next segment because because Walter's Walter's work helps to explain why there should be a cyclical rise and fall right. in civilization. Right why this process should occur. Right. Okay, well, good. Let's do that. Let's take a little break, and we'll come back, and we'll talk a little bit about Walter's work and, and what you think about it. And I know that you were at that conference. Uh, I think it was called the Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge. That's right. And, uh, so that was in, uh, in Sedona, Sedona just, uh, just quite recently. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, well, maybe we can talk a little bit about that and what, uh, what came out of that conference, all right? Sure. sure. All right, everybody, this is Mike, and uh, you're listening to Radio Orbit. My guest is Graham Hancock. He's coming to us live from Great Britain, and we appreciate him being up at this early hour of the morning to uh, share stories 
information and knowledge with, uh, with me and my listeners. So we'll be back with Graham in just a few minutes. As I said, you can get him on the web at www.grahamhancock.com. That's G-R-A-H-A-M Hancock, H-A-N-C-O-C-K.com. And you can also get there directly from the Mike Hagan com website, all right? Okay, we're going to play a little bit of music here from uh, Yachai, Returning to Sweet Mother Mercy. And this song is called Cave. We'll be back in just a few minutes with Graham Hancock. Stick around. This is Mike. You're listening to Radio Orbit. That's right. This is Mike, and you're listening to Radio Orbit. And my guest tonight is Graham Hancock. And uh, we're talking with Graham live from Great Britain. And he's been sharing some amazing stories with us about research and uh, experiences that he's had all over the globe. Uh, we've been talking about Egypt uh, recently, but we're going to move along to some other things. And I've got a lot of questions for him as well. So let's uh, get right back to it here with Graham Hancock. All right, Graham, thanks uh, for sticking around with us. That's a pleasure. We were talking about Walter Cruttenden before the break, I think. That's right. We were talking about Walter Cruttenden and this idea of uh, the procession of the equinoxes and, uh, and, and, and how it's relevant in perhaps this cycles of the ages with civilizations coming and going, so to speak. Yeah. This, is, um, this issue of, uh, of precession of the equinoxes, it sounds like a very technical term. Um, and perhaps I should just, uh, just explain that a little bit to, to, to some of the listeners. Please. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a term that is used in, in, in astronomy. Any, any culture that observes the sky over long periods of time will become aware that the positions of all the stars in the sky uh, is changing very, very slowly, uh, and that this change is in fact cyclical, uh, and that over an immense period, which is, which is just short of 26,000 years, mm -hmm. Uh, the positions of all the stars in the sky will return to their starting point. Okay. It's like a huge clock in the heavens. Right. And the, the, one of the things that this regular clock-like change of positions of all the stars in the sky uh, allows us to do uh, is, to, is to mark and commemorate uh, great periods of time and very, very ancient dates. Uh, for example, to bring to bring this back home to the United States, at the Hoover Dam uh, in the United States, when the dam was completed, and I believe that was in the 1930s, sometime. Right in Nevada. The, the yeah, the architect who who built the dam also built a huge piece of sculpture connected to the dam, which is actually models the positions of the stars in the sky over the dam at the time the dam was completed. And the very reason they did this was, was quite interesting was they said that if, for example, our civilization were to collapse and in 10,000 years archaeologists were to come along and find the remains of the Hoover Dam, hmm. if they found that sculpture with the star positions as they looked over the dam at the time of completion, they would be able to work out right. from the changed positions of the stars exactly when the dam was built. So the stars provide a kind of universal calendar in this sense. Now, the, the mainstream astronomical explanation for why this happens, why the stars change their positions, uh, is not that the stars themselves are moving, although they are, but the movements are so slow that they're not detectable over long periods of time. It is that the platform from which we view the stars, namely our Earth, right. has a wobble. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the official explanation. Right. This is not Walter Cruttenden's explanation. Exactly. Uh, that there's a wobble on the axis of the Earth, and that this wobble takes just under 26,000 years to complete a circle. And because we're standing on this wobbling Earth, it change, it, the effect to our eyes is that the positions of the stars in the sky change. Okay. Now, now this movement has been very, very helpful to, to those of us who are researching ancient civilizations, because with modern computers, we can actually simulate the positions of the stars in the sky at any time uh, over the last 26,000 years. Right. And this is where Robert Baval's work uh, needs, to be, needs to be mentioned, because using processional calculations, Robert Baval has been able to show that the pattern of the three great pyramids on the ground at Giza mm. is identical to the pattern of the three stars in the belt of the constellation of Orion. Right. Uh, as those stars look, Twelve and a half thousand years ago, in, in 10,500 BC, this is yet another indication 
that the Giza site may be much older than we imagine. Likewise, the Sphinx gazing due east would have looked precisely at the constellation of Leo the lion mm. rising on the horizon uh, on the spring equinox in 10,500 BC. So the phenomenon of precession seems to be locked into many ancient monuments. This is the, the first thing to recognize about it. But the second thing is maybe the effect that we call precession and that we see as a change of position of the stars in the sky isn't caused by a wobble on the Earth's axis. That wobble on the axis of the Earth is only theoretical. We don't know for sure that it exists. It's been invented in order to explain the phenomenon that is observed. And what Walter Cruttenden, uh, who I believe was your guest before, at the Binary Research Institute has done, is right. he's come up with a whole new theory mm -hmm. for which would equally well explain the changing positions of the stars over a cycle of 26,000 years, but would also explain why in that enormous cycle civilizations might rise and fall. Yes, all. Yeah, and this, explanation, this explanation, to cut a, a very complicated story, very simple, uh, is that our sun is locked in an orbit around another star. Uh, in fact, most stars in the sky are parts of binary systems, as they're called. Right. And the suggestion is that our star, which of course carries all the planets with it, including the Earth, is involved in a great circular orbit around the heavens, an orbit that takes 26,000 years, around another star. And the suggestion very much is that that star may be the star Sirius. Mm. And the star Sirius, by the way, was also extremely important to the ancient Egyptians. They associated it with their goddess Isis. Right, right, right. And if this were the case, if the sun is orbiting on a huge track in the heavens, carrying the earth with it, this would equally explain the changing movements of the stars as seen from earth on that 26,000-year cycle. But the suggestion is that during the course of that orbit, our planet might pass through regions of space where it is subjected, for example, to much more intense or less intense electromagnetism right. than is the case today. Uh, and that these electromagnetic effects or other more physical effects may be the reason why civilizations rise and fall, that this may have an effect on, on uh, human culture. Uh, and it is, it is by far the most rational explanation that I've, that I've come across uh, for uh, the, the mysteries of the great cycles that seem to operate in human history. And fortunately, Walter is, um, is, is really continuing to investigate this subject in depth. He's published a book on it called The Lost Star of Myth and Time. That's right. Uh, which, is, which is available on, on uh, Amazon. Um, and Walter's book uh, lays out in great detail the, the very solid scientific basis of his theory. And he has astrophysicists and astronomers working with him. And I suspect we're going to see more and more information out of Walter's Binary Research Institute in the coming years that will further support this theory. Well, I, I agree, Graham. He's doing really interesting work. And for those of you who missed that program, just go over to the archives uh, on the website and you can go listen to that show with Walter Cruttenden. It was from... Uh, uh, in November. So, yeah, real interesting stuff. It, in fact, it was right, uh, I interviewed him right before that conference uh, that you guys all uh, participated in, in in Sedona. That's right. Well, that was the conference I mentioned that Robert Schock was also okay. at it. Right. And, uh, and I was at it. It was in Sedona in, in uh, November. Uh, and it was a very, a very useful gathering of minds from, from, from all over the world to, to, to focus on this problem of ancient civilizations, ancient knowledge, and, and the, way that, the, the way that civilizations sometimes just seem to get lost uh, entirely from the record and, and are memorialized uh, only in myths and traditions and in certain artifacts and objects that just don't fit the, the conventional uh, picture of, of, of history. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that this question that I have here will be related to uh, to something that you might want to talk about. It has to do with with South America. And I remember one time, and I'm not sure where, but I, but I think that I heard you describe once uh, these areas in South America that had these amazing tunnel networks under ancient cities and, um, and, and 
And these were also associated with mounds and pyramids again. And I don't know, uh, maybe you could talk about that a little bit because it, it, I'm thinking that it ties right back into Giza like you were talking about well, before. Well, it, it does. I mean, the, the, the very, very specifically uh, in the Andes Mountains uh, around the cities of uh, the city of Cusco in Peru and, and uh, also the very ancient city of Tiwanaku mm-hmm. in Bolivia, um, you have, again, gigantic megalithic constructions on a scale very similar to those of Giza, where where ancient peoples were moving huge blocks of stone weighing hundreds of tons each and and putting them up into into walls and temples and and, and, and other structures that just just beggar belief. I mean if you go to Saxe Huaman, which is a huge site outside of Cusco in the Andes uh, you find the, the, the enormous walls of blocks of stone. There isn't a single block of stone in those walls that, lays, that weighs less than 50 tons. Oh, and some of them, and some of them weigh in the range of three to four hundred tons. My God. And, and they've been brought distances of tens of kilometers, uh, and put into place in these, in these gigantic walls. Now the official view, uh, is that these walls were the work of the Incas, uh, just four or five hundred years ago. Uh, but in fact, there isn't a single report that connects the wall to the Incas. In fact, the only report that exists is of the Incas attempting to add just one stone to these walls uh, and, and, and dismally failing to do so. Huh. Um, and the Incas themselves, again, did not claim they had built these walls. They said that they were much more ancient, that they'd inherited them, that they built their civilization uh, on top of them. Now, there have long been traditions of underground passageways uh, beneath uh, Saxe Huaman. And again, the same kind of secrecy that surrounds research at Giza uh, has re- surrounded research there. But what I think it all, uh, it all comes back to, uh, it, whether it's in South America, whether it's in Egypt, whether it's in China, whether it's in India, what it all comes back to is the hint of a much earlier civilization with technological powers that were later lost. Mm. Uh, and, and perhaps the survivors of that civilization settling at key locations around the world to keep the light of their culture burning. And, and I think that, as I say, whether, whether we see this in, in, in South America, whether we see it in Central America, whether we see it in Europe, whether we see it in Africa, we, what we are seeing are the traces of the same worldwide uh, global uh, civilization. And I, I honestly believe I've done a great deal of work on this, not only in Fingerprints of the Gods, but also in a later book called Underworld, right. uh, where, where I, in fact, went scuba diving uh, all around the world to look at, the, uh, to look at rumors of underwater right, right. I think that I think that what all this has to do with uh, is the loss of a great civilization from our record around about 12,000 years ago. And, and that is precisely the time that the last ice age came to an end, that, that, that sea levels began to rise, and in fact they rose 400 feet, that 10 million square miles of land was swallowed by the sea. 10 million square miles of land, by the way, is the, is, is, is the size of Europe and China added together, uh, was simply lost right. from, the, from, from the record and has never since been investigated by, <coughs> by, by archaeologists. And so... Uh, the, 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 the suggestion is that that's where we need to look if we want to pin this problem down. We need to be, we need to be re-examining uh, a number of mysterious monuments on land, and we need to be looking intensely in a very focused way uh, under the water. Because what I found, and, and I, back in 1996, I, I learned to scuba dive so that I could do this research. Uh, also, my wife Santa, who's a, a photographer, Amazing who photographer. Scuba dive at the same time, and we yeah. then spent from 1996 through to the end of 2002 uh, diving uh, I- 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 all around the planet. And what we were doing was we were following two lines of research. The first line of research was: Is there a myth or tradition in this area that speaks of underwater ruins? Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a fantastic number of places in the world where people preserve a memory of a great civilization that was destroyed by a flood. 
this, this is the story, of course, is most widely known from the Bible and the story of Noah's Ark. Right, right. But actually, it's very specifically remembered in many different many different the traditions. Coast. Certainly, yeah. For example, off the off the coast of India. So my first decision as to whether I would dive at a particular spot was if there was a local myth or tradition that spoke of that spoke of underwater ruins there. Secondly, I would talk to fishermen in the area. Had they seen anything odd? Had mm-hmm. they found anything? underwater, uh, had they caught their nets on anything, for example. Right. Thirdly, I would talk to, a, I worked very closely with a geologist on the research for Underworld, um, and his, he has the latest um, evidence and data built into a computer program on sea level rise at the end of the last ice age, so he would be able to reconstruct any coastline for me uh, hmm. as it looked uh, before the ice melted. Interesting. And, and where I found that there was a local myth of a flood, that there were fishermen's tales of strange objects underwater, um, and where the geology indicated that the sea level had indeed risen very rapidly in that area, then this would be a place to go diving. Okay. Right. And uh, again and again, we did find the most extraordinary and inexplicable ruins underwater uh, in these uh, in these places. And this was basically uh, the, 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 the kind of research that, that one author can do uh, is, is just scratching the surface right. of this problem. What is needed is the attention of, of large and well-funded oceanographic institutes right. Right. Uh, to, to focus on this problem in more detail. Because, of course, there is a thing called marine archaeology, mm-hmm. but marine archaeologists are mainly interested in shipwrecks from the historical period. Right. They right. aren't interested in the possibility of the ruins of a lost oh, civilization, civilization lying underwater because the, the, the picture of history that they have doesn't allow for that. So, so in a way, their theory of the past prevents the facts from being examined. Astonishing. You know, I had on my list here, I had Yanaguni, and I also had a question perhaps about Southeast India. And yes. you've, you've sort of uh, begun to address that. Maybe you could talk specifically about, uh, about those places. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, they're both places that, that I dived extensively as part of the research for my book, uh, Underworld. Yonaguni is the most um, southernmost of all the Japanese islands. It's in the, um, the Okinawa island group, um, but it's very far south, and in fact it's closest of all to, to Taiwan. And, and on a clear day you can see Taiwan from Yonaguni. Uh, it's a remote island. With a, with a small population, um, and it's, it's always been known amongst scuba divers as a great diving location, uh, because amongst other things, uh, hammerhead sharks gather into huge schools off the coast of Yonaguni, and you can have very exciting shark diving there. Cool. Right. Now, there was a local diver, uh, a man called Kihichiro Aratake, brilliant diver, Based in based in Yonaguni, I learned much that I now know about diving uh, from from him. Um, who made an amazing discovery in about 1987? He was checking out new dive sites around the island of Yonaguni, looking for more places to take his clients. Okay. And he suddenly found himself at a depth of uh, 27 uh, meters, which is close to 90 feet underwater. He suddenly found himself looking at a huge man-made structure carved into the shape of a, of, of a step pyramid with steps up the side. Um, a, a, this gigantic structure looming, looming over him. And before his air ran out, he began to explore it and investigate it and, and, and just realized that this couldn't be some sort of natural artifact. It, it had to be man-made. Um, and what was it doing 90 feet underwater? Um, very, very, very puzzling. So he went back many times. He started to take photographs of it, and and eventually um, I saw those photographs in 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 1996. And yeah. immediately I decided that I had to learn to dive and go see this structure. Amazing. Since then, since then I've done, I would say, close to 300 dives on on the Yonaguni structure itself. Um, and I have I have no doubt that we're dealing with, uh, with, with a gigantic piece of, of man-made stone carving. Just as the Great Sphinx is carved out of solid rock, so also this object is carved out of solid rock. Hmm. It has beautifully regular right-angled steps uh, all the way up it. It has sculptures carved into the surface of it. 
uh, and it is part of a group of monuments along the southeast coast of the island of Yonaguni, uh, all of which were submerged 10,000 or 12,000 years ago. And at that time, there isn't supposed to have been any civilization in Japan or anywhere else in the world. Uh, the same goes for southeast India. Uh, my wife, Sampa, I mentioned she's a photographer. Yes. Uh, her first language is, in fact, Tamil, which is the, the mm. language that's yeah, spoken right. in southern India. Right. Uh, and when we traveled in southern India for our research, she was able to gain the confidence of the local fishermen who talked very openly and freely to her. And they told her that offshore of two places that we investigated, one is called Mahabalipuram and the other is called Pumpahar, that offshore of both of these places there were underwater ruins. And from the fishermen's point of view, the underwater ruins were quite annoying because they would catch their nets on them. And sometimes a free diver would have to go down, take some risks, and, and release the net. Right, right, right. And they said they told lots of people about these underwater ruins, but actually nobody would listen to them or believe them hmm. that the underwater ruins were there. So we mounted an expedition um, in, over two years, in 2001 and 2002, uh, and dived on these structures exactly where the fishermen said. And by the way, there's a myth there as well um, of a great city that existed off the coast, and they say that the gods became angry at the beauty and perfection of the city because it was even more beautiful than the cities in heaven, hmm. and that for this reason they sent a flood to swallow up the city and uh, take it away. And to cut a long story short, we did uh, discover ruins uh, off the shore in both of these locations, some of them very deep, down to depths of 30 meters, close to 100 feet underwater. Some of them in, in less deep water. Um, and uh, sure enough, when the tragedy of the, of the Indian Ocean tsunami occurred mm. two years later, uh, and briefly the bay in front of Mahabalipuram was emptied out as the waves receded, uh, everybody saw that these ruins that we had found with our diving two years before were indeed there. <laughs> and hopefully now... Some serious research will be done to investigate these ruins and find out what on earth they are. Right, that was an amazing story. I remember reading in one of the uh, maybe New Scientists or something like that that, uh, yeah, that when the tsunami emptied the bay prior to the wave coming in, <coughs> that it just revealed this amazing uh, uh, ruinous city. Down city, there. underwater, un 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 underwater city. And the thing about it is that it goes out much further than just the bay in front of Mahabalipur, and we were diving on structures as much as five kilometers three miles from the shore. Wow. So we're looking at a very, very extensive uh, remains here, some of which are extremely ancient because they've been underwater for more than 10,000 years. Huh. Absolutely amazing. All right. Well, look, uh, Graham, I think that's a good time to take another break here. We're just about the bottom of the hour. So let's do that, and uh, we will come back, though, and uh, move along a little bit further, and let's talk about your new book, uh, Supernatural, because... Uh, interestingly, this uh, ties in as well, and uh, you've now entered into the realm of the shaman. Yes. All right, well, let's uh, do that. We'll come back in just a few moments. My guest is Graham Hancock, and uh, you're listening to it with Mike Hagan on Radio Orbit. We're going to continue with some appropriate music. Once again, this is Yachai, and uh, with regard to information on the web, you can get both to Graham's website and to Yachai's website, both of them directly from MikeHagan.com. If you want to uh, get directly to Graham's website, just hop on there and go to www.grahamhancock, G-R-A-H-A-M, Hancock, H-A-N-C-O-C-K.com, and uh, put him in your bookmarks. He's got a wonderful site and covers a lot of this breaking uh, news uh, with regard to these particular topics as well. He's got a great news section over there. So... We will be back with Graham in just a few minutes, and in the meantime, one more from Yachai. This is called Mama, a wonderful song that has to do with the vine that we're going to talk a little bit about, I imagine, Banisteriopsis capi, this uh, particular vine that's combined with another plant, Cicotria viridis, I think it's called. But at any rate, uh, they make this concoction called ayahuasca, and... Uh, that's what this song is about. So we'll be back in just a few minutes with Graham Hancock. We'll talk about his new book, Supernatural. Stick around. All right. That's Mama from Yachai, from Sweet Mother Mercy, and music inspired by the work and the teachings of legendary Peruvian shaman Don Augustine, 
who has uh, done wonderful things with my friends Jeff and William from Yachai. And that song is available for download on the website. If you go over to MikeHagan.com and just click on the music section, uh, just a page down, you'll see Yachai uh, prominently presented there. And you can download that song, Mama, from Sweet Mother Mercy. And that's compliments of the guys. So thanks a lot. And the website, of course, is uh, directly available there as well. And on the front uh, page of the website, the link right over to Graham Hancock is uh, the first thing you'll see. And his website is available as well. And we've mentioned that tonight, but it is GrahamHancock.com. And uh, put it in your bookmarks, okay? Amazing information there. And we're going to continue with Graham right now and discuss uh, his new book. It actually hasn't even been published in the States yet, but uh, it's worthwhile to talk about it because there's amazing stuff inside the book uh, from what I hear and from what I understand from what I've read already. Uh, so, Graham, maybe you can give us a little bit of a synopsis about, uh, about your, 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 your most recent uh, uh, experience here and, and, and what brought you into the, in the, into the South American jungles and, and, and to the shaman. Well, the book is the book is called Supernatural, and the subtitle is Meetings with the Ancient Teachers of uh, Mankind. The, the book is published in Britain. It was published in Britain on uh, in October, uh, and it's also just been published in Canada. Um, but it is not published in the U.S. yet. Uh, it will be published in the U.S. next uh, September hmm. or October, September or October 2006. If anybody wants to get hold of it, they can get hold of it from Amazon.ca, okay. uh, the, the the Canadian branch of uh, of, of Amazon. Huh. Yeah. Uh, and once again, the, the title is the title is simply Supernatural uh, Meetings with the with the Ancient Teachers of Mankind. Okay. Um, where I went with this book, it well, let me let me begin with a with a with a statement. Uh, the, the, which is to do with the conclusion that I've come to. Certainly. Which is that inside every human mind, there is a secret doorway. Mm. And that that doorway may be opened by certain techniques, allowing us to project our consciousness through into other worlds, other parallel dimensions that are real, but that are not normally accessible to us in this world. Mm. And... The evidence that I've gathered suggests that about 2% of every human population has the ability to open this door inside their own brains and go through into other dimensions spontaneously. They can do it without any help. Okay. Uh, and those are the psychics and the mediums, and also, I believe, people who have the experience of being abducted by UFOs and aliens. Mm. I think that what they are experiencing is an interdimensional contact that is made available to them through their own consciousness. Okay. It happens to them spontaneously. For the rest of us, if we want to have those experiences, we need help. We don't just have the, the quite the right brain chemistry to, to access these experiences. And that help uh, has traditionally been available through a range of techniques that have been developed by shamans in traditional societies for tens of thousands of years. Right. These are techniques for entering into what the scientists call an altered state of consciousness. Uh, in some tribal shamanic cultures, this is achieved uh, through rhythmic dancing. For example, the Bushman cultures of southern Africa, uh, their shamans enter an altered state of consciousness in which they are able to contact the spirit world uh, by dancing all night long uh, in a very rhythmic, regular way uh, and, until they become... Uh, they fall into a deep state of trance. And in that state of trance, they are able to send their consciousness into what they experience as an absolutely real other world filled with spirits and gods uh, with whom they must, uh, uh, they must interact. Mm. And they, 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 they believe that whether we like it or not, we're involved with the supernatural realm. Uh, and that it's much, that it's really important that we come to terms with that and learn to deal with the supernatural realm, and that's their technique for doing it. In South America, uh, a different technique is used to alter brain chemistry in the right way. And this technique you mentioned before the break um, in, involves drinking a brew called ayahuasca. Now, ayahuasca is made, there are more than 80,000 different species of plants in the Amazon. 
And somehow, the traditional tribal peoples of the Amazon made the extraordinary discovery that if you mix two of these plants together and cook them for many hours, you produce a liquid that, when drunk, uh, completely changes the level of your consciousness. Uh, and the two plants in, in, uh, that are involved, as you rightly said, one of them is a bush. The scientific name for it is Cicutria viridis. They call it Chacrina in the Amazon. Yeah, Chacrina. The leaves, <laughs> the leaves of the bush contain a very powerful hallucinogen called dimethyltryptamine, DMT, totally illegal in the United States, by the way. Um, if uh, the leaves themselves are consumed orally or cooked into a tea and drunk, they have no effect on us whatsoever uh, because there's an enzyme in our stomachs that destroys DMT in, on contact. But the other ingredient of the brew, which is the vine called Banisteriopsis carpi, one of these jungle vines that hangs down from the tall trees, it contains a chemical which switches off the enzyme in our stomach and allows the DMT in the leaves to be absorbed orally. So first and foremost, we are dealing with what, with what our scientists call hallucinations here. Mm. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a chemical compound which, uh, which gives us hallucinations. Now, the great mistake that our society has made uh, is to believe that hallucinations are just disturbed brain chemistry mm. and nothing else. There's a tendency to despise and even demonize hallucinations in yeah. our society yeah. uh, and, to, and to minimize their importance. But the truth of the matter is <clears throat> that our scientists don't have a clue what hallucinations are. They don't understand why in certain altered states of consciousness, we start seeing things that don't exist in the real world at all, in this physical world that we live in. Right. And, and what, one of the areas that I go into in the new book, Supernatural, is that the, the minimal scientific research that has been allowed into this subject, for example, Dr. Rick Strathman's work sure. at the University of New Mexico, yeah. Uh, where DMT was given to human volunteers over a period of 10 years, yeah, so has begun, it's begun to shape the fate of those scientists in the existing model of reality and to suggest an extraordinary new possibility, which is the possibility that shamans have known to be true all along, that our brains operate like receivers, mm. most of the, like TV receivers. Most of the time, we are tuned in to channel normal, we have to be in that alert, problem-solving state of consciousness that is necessary for us to function in this physical world. But that it is possible, through the use of shamanic techniques, whether it's drinking ayahuasca or dancing all night, as the case of the Bushman, yeah. that it is possible to retune the receiver wavelengths of the brain and give our consciousness access to other levels of reality that are normally close to us, and that these levels of reality appear to be inhabited by intelligent beings who wish to communicate with us. Right. This yeah. is what shamans have known all along, uh, and it's a, it's a proposition that our society, which is so firmly rooted and grounded in the material world, that our society has difficulty in accepting. But as I investigated this subject much more closely, uh, I came to realize that the shamans are right that we're dealing with a profound mystery here, that the supernatural is all around us, that it can be accessed through changing our state of consciousness, and that some of the most important steps in human evolution may have occurred because our ancestors did access that supernatural realm. Absolutely. Absolutely. <coughs> Very interesting, Graham. You know, you know, I've, that's uh, why I say it's like a it's like a doorway. It's right. the, best, the best way I can see it, to put it in very simple terms, it's like deep inside our own mind, right. buried beneath the level of our consciousness, is a doorway that's always been waiting there for us, which we can open, which allows us into a much wider reality than we normally inhabit. Right. Now, you know, uh, the work of Rick Strassman, and he did wonderful work there. I've actually interviewed Dr. Rick Strassman before. And, Good. And he, one of the remarkable things about DMT, and you, you make the, the, the point that dimethyltryptamine is, is a Schedule One illegal substance here in the United States. Well, yeah. in, interestingly, it's, uh, it exists naturally in all of our brains. That's right. We all we all have it. Yes. We all have DMT in our brains, and as Rick Strassman's 
pioneering work at the University of New Mexico has shown. It is produced by the pineal gland. Yes. Uh, it is a natural substance in the, in the human body. Uh, and evolution did not put it there for nothing. Uh, it's there for a reason. And, and that, that Rick's conclusion is, is, is precisely the one that I've just mentioned, that it is there to allow us to access the spirit world, for want of a better word. Right. Let's call it uh, the spirit world, as the, as, as the shamans do. Uh, and and part, of, part of my research has been to show that accessing the spirit world uh, has been absolutely fundamental in human history, that we would not be human if we did not have that ability to access the spirit world. So it may be that our societies, in all their arrogance and scientific pride, may actually be making a terrible mistake mm. in criminalizing and demonizing the kind of explorations of consciousness that shamans in traditional cultures undertake every day of the week. We, we don't allow those explorations of consciousness. We won't even think about them. We get hysterical and deeply nervous when anybody talks about hallucinogens. Mm. Um, this may be a huge error that we're making. We may be defying our own evolution uh, by this, this misguided uh, social policy that causes so much misery. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, quite frankly. I think you put it very well right there. So, all right, so this is, uh, how, how does this tie in? Is, is this the, the, the primary focus of the book? Well, no, the primary, the, the book for me began with a mystery, and, and, and as, as most of my books do. And the mystery has to do with the so-called human career. Uh, I, I accept the basic evidence of, of evolution as mm -hmm. regards the, the human story. And, and our first ancestors, you can trace back six million years to the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee. And since then, the human line anatomically has been fairly clear. And what we see is, I'll be completely frank about this, six million years of boredom. Mm. The early human creatures... As they be, what happened as millions of years passed was they began to look more and more like us. They started off about three feet tall with very tiny brains. And as the millions of years passed, you can see from the skeletal record that they became taller, that the brain size became larger, that the brow ridges began to recede, that they began to look more and more like us. But over almost all of this period, their behavior is incredibly dull and uninteresting. Mm -hmm. What is it that makes a human being human? You know, the anthropologists used to think it was walking on two legs that right. made us human. Right. No, that's not what makes us human. Lots of creatures walk on two legs, uh, and, and they are not human, and they don't behave like humans. Is it tool using that makes us human? Again, we know now that this is not exclusive to human beings. Right. Right. Gorillas and chimpanzees use tools, yes, and, and actually even birds use Tools, like crows. So tool using isn't what makes us human. It's, it's the ability to manipulate symbols, to think symbolically, mm. to think in the abstract, to conceive of something that isn't right there in front of our faces. That's the real, that's the real defining quality of the human being. Right. And, and the plain fact is that you don't see any evidence of that in the archaeological record for almost the whole of our six million year story. Mm. Even when our ancestors had reached full anatomical modernity. In other words, when they looked exactly like you and me, when their brain size was identical to ours, which starts about 200,000 years ago, even then, their behavior was just incredibly dull and boring, with no creativity, no innovation, no sign whatsoever of a spiritual life, no symbolism, no art, no evidence of abstract thinking. And this continues right the way down until very, very recently, just about 40, 40,000 years ago, mm -hmm. when suddenly it's like a light has been switched on <laughs> all over the world, right. and everything that we regard as real human behavior appears as a package all at once. And, and right there with that package, the very beginning of the package, are these extraordinary works of art right. that our ancestors painted right. on the cave mm. in Europe and on rock walls as far afield as Australia and South Africa. Mm. And the mystery of these works of art, and that was really what drove me to investigate us, is that the very first and earliest things they show are supernatural beings. Mm. Beings of a kind that are not encountered in daily life. Typically, these would be 
creatures with the body of an animal and the head of a human being. Hmm. Now, where do we see such things? We don't see them in daily life, but we do see them in altered states of consciousness. This is one of the mysteries, is that the latest lab research, for example, Rick Strassman's research at the University of New Mexico, his volunteers were seeing exactly the same kind of mysterious supernatural beings that are painted on the cave walls right. and in the rock shelters from 35,000 years ago. Uh, and clearly what they all have in common is an altered state of consciousness. In fact, it's obvious, it's evident, and most, the majority of anthropologists and archaeologists don't even bother to dispute this anymore, <laughs> that our ancestors encountering and exploring altered states of consciousness was the very thing that made us human. Right. Shamanic techniques were, perhaps they stumbled across hallucinogenic plants, Initially, by accident, they thought they were food items. They ate them, and they had these amazing experiences which completely changed their outlook on the world. Sure. These experiences are still being had today by shamans. And if we listen to what the shamans say, they tell us that the spirit beings, the supernatural beings that they encounter in the other world, are their teachers, that they teach them everything they know about how to bring healing remedies back to their tribe, about the properties of plants that all of this is taught to them by the spirit world. And my suggestion is that this is exactly what happened to our ancestors 40,000 years ago, that they were lifted out of six million years of dull, wicked stupidity and turned on into the modern, creative, spiritual creature that we have become mm. by encounters with spirit beings. And those encounters were facilitated by a change of consciousness and that change of consciousness was most likely brought about by initially the accidental consumption hmm. of hallucinogenic uh, plants. Um, so, so what I'm saying is it's not an accident that these plants have evolved alongside us. Right. Right. And that if we were wise in modern society, we would be looking for, for careful and intelligent ways to explore the mysteries that these plants lead us into instead of hysterically criminalizing and demonizing uh, their consumption. Well, as I said, I couldn't agree more, and uh, I look forward to uh, to reading the book. And uh, I've got to ask, why is is there any uh, is is this related in any way to the reason why it, why it's taking an extra nine months or ten months to publish it here in the states? Well, the feeling the feeling was that the book is just is just now um, out with uh, out, out with publishers in the states, and we're we're just at the point of doing a deal now, which is why I can say that it will definitely be published uh, in September or October next year in the states. But this is a this is a difficult and a dangerous subject. Yeah, yeah. Uh, know, we have a we have a thing called the war on drugs in our society, yeah. where anybody who even mentions any mind altering substance in a positive light is seen as being extremely suspicious and and and, and dangerous. It's a subject that we just can't talk about uh, in our society. So yes, it has slowed down the publication of the book in the U.S. a little bit, but uh, that problem has been has been overcome. Uh, actually, I'm not advocating uh, the use of drugs. Uh, what I'm what I'm saying is that we need to listen to the wisdom of humanity as a whole, and the wisdom of humanity as a whole has indicated that certain of these plants, for example, the ingredients of ayahuasca found in the Amazon jungle, may play a fundamental role in what made us human in the first place, right. and that it would therefore be very stupid of us uh, to fail to examine the changes of consciousness that these plants uh, bring. Uh, I've, I've become convinced through my own research, through my own experiences with ayahuasca and other shamanic plants, that there is indeed a, a supernatural realm and that it surrounds us and interpenetrates our daily lives in every way. Uh, but that normally we cannot gain access to it because we are so focused on just surviving in the physical uh, material world. I think that everything that people call supernatural experiences uh, whether it's encounters with fairies and elves uh, in the European Middle Ages, whether it's the beings that uh, that we like to call aliens in the modern world. I don't think those are nuts and bolts, physical aliens right. from other planets coming here in metal spaceships. Right. I think they're much more like the spirit beings that shamans in encounter. In fact, the connections are eerie and stunning hmm. between the, the beings that shamans encounter and, and so-called uh, alien abductions. Everything that we call ghosts, and, and, and spirits, all of this uh, is 
becomes accessible to us if we change the level of consciousness. So when people have supernatural experiences, it's because their their state of consciousness has briefly been changed, Mm -hmm. whether by electromagnetic fields, whether by the consumption of hallucinogenic plants, whether just because they are people who can spontaneously fall into that state of mind. And briefly, they've been allowed a glimpse into another reality. Mm. And, and, and what the shamanic techniques allow us to do, if we're only willing to grasp this issue and actually do something about it, what the techniques that shamans have cultivated for thousands of years allow us to do is to systematically explore, encounter, and interact with the supernatural realm. Right, and, uh, and, and I guess the, the rubber meets the road when they come back with valid, legitimate, relevant information. Which they, which they do. Right. Again, I, I publish this research for the first time. I bring it all together in my book, Supernatural, uh, is that the scientific research with human volunteers and altered states of consciousness shows that every individual, even if they've had no contact whatsoever with one another, even if they're from completely different cultures, even if they're from completely different periods of history, in altered states of consciousness, they go to the same place mm. and encounter the same beings with the same messages. Now, if all of these experiences are completely unreal, then we cannot explain this universality and this commonality of experience. There has to be some basis of reality underneath it. Uh, and this is, uh, this is an area that our society is utterly ignorant of and that shamanic societies are the experts in. As a matter of fact, Many of the shamans I worked with in the Amazon feel a sense of mission. Mm. They feel it's important that they come to the West, that they come to North America, that they come to Britain, they come to Europe, and teach us how to reconnect with the spirit world. Because they believe that that the, the doom that Western society is spreading around the planet results from the fact that Westerners have lost their contact with the spirit world, that we've cut ourselves off from it and we desperately need to rediscover it. And they therefore believe that ayahuasca may be the vehicle for the salvation of the West and they feel a strong urge to introduce us to it. And and I believe that this is very important work that they're doing. Wow. All right. Well, it's... uh... Uh, it's amazing work, and I'm very glad that you're uh, that you're pursuing it because uh, it's something that I've been interested in for a long time too, and we talk about it uh, on this program uh, pretty frequently. So really great to see the work that you're doing, and I think it is really important. And uh, so what we'll do is we'll definitely have to plan another program, Graham, uh, and talk about the book when it's released. Uh, at yes, the... I'll keep you posted about that, Mike, and hopefully hopefully I can come back on and, and we'll do a discussion about, about Supernatural when it's published in the States in September or October. Absolutely, we'll do it. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately, two hours like that, as, uh, as, as usual, the time flies. So uh, I can't thank you much. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't thank you enough. It's been uh, yeah. an early morning thing for you, and, and, and me and, and all my audience certainly really appreciate it, Graham. Thanks from my heart. Real pleasure to talk to you. Look forward to the next time. Yep, we'll be in touch. Thanks again, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thanks, sir. Bye. All right, everybody, that was Graham Hancock. Thanks uh, once again for a wonderful uh, sharing of information and experience, and you can get more about Graham at www.grahamhancock, G-R-A-H-A-M, Hancock.com, and uh, once again, he'll be uh, in the archives at my site uh, within 24 hours or so. All right, so this is Mike, and uh, next week, Joseph Chilton Pierce. And we'll have uh, an interview that I did a couple of weeks ago with Joe Pierce, and I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about some Christmas tradition, sort of uh, ties into what Graham and I were talking about uh, in the last segment of the show. Uh, But anyway, uh, come on back next week, and we will do it up. I'm not sure who's coming in after me right now, but uh, hopefully somebody's coming pretty soon because uh, I'm ready to hit it. had a great show, and I am uh, intellectually done now after uh, that conversation. Amazing stuff from Graham, uh, Graham Hancock, and uh, thanks one more time for, uh, for the work that he's doing. All right, let's finish things off with Yachai. Thanks to Yachai Music for providing all the music for the conversation tonight. Wonderful stuff. I've spent, I guess, the best part of the last 15 years writing about uh, 
historical mysteries, right? writing factual books about some of the great mysteries of the past. But I, I certainly didn't start out with an interest in in historical mysteries. Um, I, I, I was originally a, a journalist, and I spent a lot of time in Africa. Uh, I was the East Africa correspondent for The Economist, um, based in Nairobi in Kenya and traveling very widely uh, around that region. And back in the, in the 70s and through most of the 80s, my uh, my interest was totally on current affairs mm-hmm. uh, and and politics and uh, wars and famines and everything that one must deal with in uh, in, in in the African context. Right. Um, what happened was that one of the countries that I used to visit very regularly for 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 my work as a journalist was Ethiopia. Ethiopia was very much in the news in the 1980s yes. for, for sad and unfortunate reasons. Yeah. Terrible, a terrible famine and, and terrible series of, of, of wars yeah. racked the country um, and, and made it a, a, a miserable and dangerous place to live during the 1980s. But I, I had to go there very, very regularly for my work. And while I was traveling in, in northern Ethiopia, uh, I visited a, a, a historic city called Aksum, and at that time, uh, Aksum was completely, it was in the hands of the government, but it was completely surrounded by rebel forces, and so the only way into it was to sort of dive down into it in an, in an ancient uh, airplane and hope not to get shot out of the sky, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is what we did. And, and in Aksum, um, I, I came across the most extraordinary story, um, the, the it's a sacred city. It has a it has a cathedral, the Cathedral of mm-hmm. St. Mary of, of mm-hmm. Zion. It's important to register that Ethiopia is a very ancient Christian country. Uh, and in fact it it adopted Christianity long before Europe and and uh, Britain did, for example. Mm-hmm. Ethiopia is one of the oldest Christ- Christian countries on, on earth. And and in Axum uh, I found talking to the monks and the priests of Axum uh, this, uh, the, the, that they were making the most amazing claim. They, they said that their city was the last resting place of the Ark of the Covenant. Right, right, right. Uh, now, this is, this is the same Ark of the Covenant that, uh, that we're all familiar with from the wonderful Indiana Jones movie, mm-hmm. Raiders of, of the Lost Ark, which had been released actually not long before uh, I went to Axum. So I immediately pricked up my ears and thought, what, what, what on earth is this about? And I... I was taken to a, a, a chapel surround, surrounded by steel railings in the in, in the, the courtyard of the of the uh, cathedral of St Mary of Zion, and there I met an ancient monk who who was the guardian of the ark, and he explained to me very solemnly that in the building behind him was the ark of the covenant, oh, really? and it was his role, his responsibility, his sacred trust to guard and protect uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And could I see it? No, certainly I could not see it. As a matter of fact, nobody was allowed to see it uh, except him. Um, and uh, in fact, it was a very dangerous object. Uh, in, on such rare occasions that it was brought out of the chapel, he explained that it was always wrapped. Ethiopia, at that time, contained a, a population, a Jewish population, and these were, uh, they were called the Falashas, and they were also known as the Beta Israel, the House of Israel. And uh, they were practicing a very ancient form of Judaism, um, a pre-Talmudic form of Judaism. They mm-hmm. still practiced sacrifice. They had priests, which is quite unknown in modern Judaism. They did not have rabbis. And it seemed that they were a sort of frozen pocket of Old Testament Judaism in Ethiopia. And so gradually... As the pieces came together, I began to realize that Ethiopia did indeed have a claim to possess the Ark of the Covenant. Huh, amazing. So, where did it lead? Well, um, Ethiopia was locked in a, in, in, in a civil war, and my, my return visits to the country were getting, were getting more and more difficult. I traveled, I traveled far and wide, and finally, eventually, uh, in 1991, having... This, this story extends much more widely than, than Ethiopia. To trace the story of the Ark of the Covenant, I found it, it was very important to look at the figure of Moses mm. in the Bible. Who, who was Moses? What do we know about Moses? Um, he is the, he's the one most directly associated 
with the Ark of the Covenant, because when he leads the children of Israel out of Egypt uh, and into the wilderness of Sinai, uh, it's, at, it's at the foot of Mount Sinai that the Ark of the Covenant is built. And it's built to contain the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, on which the Ten Commandments are, are written uh, by the finger of God in, himself. And, and so we, we can't separate Moses uh, who receives the Ten Commandments from God, we can't separate him from the mystery of the Ark of the Covenant. So I had to research Moses in depth. That meant traveling to Egypt and getting, this was back in the in the late 80s, and getting myself for the first first time immersed in the mysteries of the, of Egyptian culture. And of course, Moses, we're told in the, in the Bible, was raised in the court of the Pharaoh. This meant that he would that he was raised and groomed as a, as a Pharaoh. Right, right, and as right. such, he he would have been um, initiated into all the secrets and mysteries of Egyptian magic. Okay. And, I, and I discovered that there were, in fact, in ancient Egyptian tradition, there are many objects which sound like the Ark of the Covenant, golden boxes hmm. uh, containing some mysterious, uh, so, so, some mysterious stone. And these golden boxes are, are, are filled with a kind of radiant power, and if people touch them, they are, they are struck dead by them, exactly the same as we read in the Bible about the, about the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, it, it, um, it, 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 it was necessary for me to travel to Israel to research this story. Uh, fascinating and wonderful country that I've since revisited many times. Talk to scholars in Israel, and, and as I began going into this matter with, with biblical scholars, I realized that there was a real problem because the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned in the Old Testament um, more than 200 times. Right. Um, but at a certain point, it just disappears from the story. Hmm. And that disappearance from the story um, is round about 650 before Christ. It just vanishes completely from the story. And 100 years later, uh, the city of Jerusalem is invaded and destroyed by the Babylonians. But at that point, it's clear that the Ark of the Covenant has already gone missing. The Babylonians don't get it. It isn't listed amongst the objects stolen from the temple by the Babylonians. So at that end, too, there's a great mystery. This object just vanishes from the story. And, and I began to realize that there was a strong case that it could have gone to Ethiopia. And, and I investigate that case in great depth in, in uh, cloth and in leather bindings, and this was to not to protect it from the public, but to protect the public from it. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and I thought this was the most, the most extraordinary and fascinating story, but obviously I wasn't sure whether, whether there was any truth to it or not. It, mm -hmm. became, it became something that I wanted to investigate. Was this just a bunch of crazy old monks <laughs> telling a story? Right. Um, or, was, or was it actually possible that it, that it could be true? And... and during the 1980s, really as a kind of background to other things I was doing, and without any particular focus, I began to gather information on this story. And I began to talk to academics and scholars about it. And I found most of the academics were very dismissive of the Ethiopian claim. Yes, they had heard that Ethiopia claimed to possess the Ark of the Covenant, but no, it couldn't possibly be true. That tended to be their attitude. And yet I found that these, these were people who really knew nothing uh, about the Ethiopian claim. And the Ethiopian claim, as I discovered, was, as my research continued, extends much further than Axum. In fact, every single church in Ethiopia, Christian church, contains a replica of the Ark of the Covenant, which is kept in its Holy of Holies. Hmm. We're talking about more than 20,000 churches with 20,000 replicas here. And these, these replicas are so important that if they're taken out of the church, then the church ceases to be a sacred building. It's, it's deconsecrated. So there was clearly some, and all of them gained their power by reference to the original Ark of the Covenant in the sanctuary chapel in Axum, in, Axum. in, in right. northern Ethiopia. Yeah. And I felt that something so widespread and so, so intense and so strongly felt throughout the whole culture couldn't just be based on nothing. Uh, as the academic said, so I so I continued to research and investigate this matter further, and I found that there were many anomalies and many problems. For example, if